Members, Mr. Colin McGrath has given notice of an urgent oral question to the Minister of Health. I would remind members that they wish to ask a supplementary question they should rise continually in your places. The member who tabled the question will be called automatically for a supplementary. Clerk, please read the question. To ask the Minister of Health how his department will address the shortage of 200,000 flu vaccinations, which has been described as deeply, deeply concerning and frustrating by senior GPs. And I call the Minister of Health. Minister. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I'm, I'm, glad to, I'm glad to have this opportunity to come to the House today to clarify some of the issues regarding this year's flu programme. First of all, let me assure members, and even more importantly those listening at home, there is no shortage of ordered vaccines. Uh, in total this year, 1,050,300 doses have been procured for the flu vaccination programme. As of last Friday morning, 826,890 doses have been delivered into Northern Ireland. 601,243 doses have been delivered to GPs and trusts. I can confirm that as of this morning, following two further deliveries, totalling 192,700 doses, the total vaccine delivered now stands at 1,019,590 doses, and around 30,000 doses of the childhood vaccine are still to be delivered. And this is only remaining order that is outstanding. As was outlined by the Public Health Agency last month, uptake has been exceptional, with people getting the vaccine in higher numbers than ever before. So a temporary pause was placed on some aspects of the seasonal flu programme. Those additional vaccines are now available. In regards to the over 65 vaccine, let me again assure members that there are significant quantities of, quantities of vaccine available. There are approximately 323,000 people over the age of 65 in Northern Ireland. Initially, we aimed for an 85 per cent uptake target, which equates to 275,000 vaccines. So we purchased 286,000 vaccines. Last month, I approved the purchase of a further 10,000 vaccines, bringing that total to 296,000. Those additional 10,000 additional vaccines arrived in Northern Ireland on Thursday, the 5th of November. So the reports in the media today of Northern Ireland being almost 200,000 doses short of the flu vaccine for the over 65 age cohort are being unable to complete its vaccination programme are simply not true. So once again, I want to reassure everyone listening, there is no shortage. Further plans are now in place to procure even further quantities of vaccine as a later date, at a later date if necessary. But finally, Mr Speaker, I would like to thank all our GPs, um, practice nurses and community pharmacy for their expertise and persistence over recent weeks. This is an incredibly busy and pressurised time for them all, and yet without them our flu programme could simply not succeed. Call Colin McGrath, supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for coming to the Chamber today. Uh, the news when it broke this morning was deeply worrying and deeply concerning for people who are facing uh, the perils of COVID uh, and a fear of getting the seasonal flu, which may put them into a position where they're more vulnerable uh, for other uh, illnesses. And this was scaring and frightening people. So it is very welcome that the Minister has been able to come here today and put that record straight and send a clear message to people uh, that they will be able to receive the vaccine that they require. But maybe then if I could just ask um, two questions. Uh, one, can you give an assurance that all people over the age of 65 and those with underlying conditions will be able to access in a timely manner uh, that vaccine before the flu season starts as projected in December? And can maybe, if you've got a sense of the breakdown of communication that has led uh, medics within the sector to make the announcement that they did today? Thank you. Um, I think the member, I, I had a meeting just prior to coming to the House with the PHA and the Health and Social Care Board and representatives uh, to have a discussion in regards to how that communication failure actually came about. Um, there seemed to be, have a, been a meeting between all parties uh, last week, which has led to, I think, what has been described as an accurate reporting um, by the BBC. Uh, the BBC report incorrectly stated that Northern Ireland did not receive its full vaccine quota 
while mon one million doses were ordered, uh, they claimed that between 500,000 and 600,000 were delivered. And I have assured the House in my opening statements of the numbers that have been procured, ordered, and are currently uh, delivered in, in Northern Ireland. In regards to, to the uptake that the member talks about, um, I am due to receive a, a report by the end of uh, this week in regards to the normal uptake of the different flu vaccines that are used because we use different strains for uh, children, for the under 65s and for the over 65s. This uh, concern seems to be in the over 65 population. And in my opening statement, I equated how we had actually uh, ordered for the equivalence of an 85 per cent uptake in, in that cohort, uh, which is actually far in advance of what was actually um, used this time last year when we had 74.8 per cent uptake. So we had actually ordered additional vaccines, and we are getting additional vaccine on top of that as well to ensure uh, that we can get those cohorts vaccinated. We're now working with our GPs to make sure that we can get those uh, vaccination programmes and mass vaccination events back up and running again to ensure that that is done in a timely fashion. I call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I suppose probably at first can I say and put on record my sincere thanks to those doctors and nurses uh, that have been implementing a, a very successful uh, flu vaccine programme to date. Uh, we've all seen it within our own, own communities, uh, the, the level of organisation has went out. But, Minister, I suppose probably I come to the Chamber with a considerable degree of concern as to what is exactly going on within the department and within PHA. The PHA did say this morning in a statement uh, the demand for vaccine uh, has resulted in a temporary pause in the supply of vaccine for eligible people under 65 and additional controls to ensure fair distribution to all GP practices across Northern Ireland. Dr Jerry Waldron, Head of Health Protection for the PHA, said he regretted some flu clinics had to be cancelled. So I think this is in stark contrast to what the Minister is saying in the House today. So can I ask him in that spirit, uh, does this build confidence for people that look towards a potential COVID-19 vaccine in the future as to how it will be implemented across Northern Ireland? Um, I, I do not think it is in contrast when you actually uh, listen to what PHA did say. There was a pause in the vaccine because the member I, may not be aware. When it comes to the delivery of flu vaccines, they come in two batches. They come in the initial batch that we ordered back at the start of the year, then the additional batches that we ordered actually during the summer. Why some of those clinics were actually paused was to allow uh, the delivery of the second batches of vaccine. Uh, what we did see in the initial, I suppose, setup um, of those mass flu vaccination programmes was an exceptional uptake. And I reported, I think it was in the House last week, uh, to the member's uh, colleague Paula Bradley. Uh, in regards to some of the uptakes we have actually seen, where some GPs were reporting sending out 500 letters and 499 uh, attendees actually turning up, whereas in the past what we have actually seen, Mr Speaker, would have been a maximum of in the region of 75 per cent uptake as well. So in regards uh, to the member's assertion to try and, I, I think, tug down the programme, I think what we actually saw was that the advance in the early stages was an exceptional uptake uh, and delivery and coordination between PHA, GPs, community pharmacy and those nurses as well. So now that we have um, those uh, I suppose, structures in place where we can do those vast max vaccination uh, outreach programmes, should they be in community halls, church halls, uh, car parks, um, underground car parks as well, where we were doing uh, in-car vaccination programmes as well, it actually sends us, or sets us up with a sound basis as to what the COVID vaccination programme would look like once that vaccine does become available. I call Colin Gillerney. Coramaga, can call you and thank the Minister for coming to the Chamber today to answer questions in relation to this. And Minister, you have referred there to modelling and planning, but can I ask specifically um, what modelling and preparation the Department made into the demand and the uptake of the flu vaccine this year and when that was completed and by who? Um, I thank the Chair for his, uh, for his questions. Uh, the, the planning we actually did this year was for an uptake target of, and specifically for the over 65 cohort, for, was actually for an 85 per cent uptake target. Uh, whereas in the past, as I said in earlier answers, I think the, 
to Mr McGrath. And last year we actually saw a 74.8% uptake. The year prior to that was 70% uptake. So to, to target for an 85% uptake, um, the numbers that we actually ordered even allowed for a 7% uh, wastage rate, which would be normal in a large-scale vaccination programme. So those calculations were done by PHA. Um, and that is why we actually ordered that additional vaccine over the summer period as well to complement what would have been our original order, uh, which was made at the start of the year to allow for production and also delivery. I call Alan Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, one of the benefits of being part of the United Kingdom is that the four nations have shared resources throughout the pandemic. So whilst I very much welcome today's clarity from the Minister, which again emphasises the need for accuracy and public reporting at this time. Will the Minister contact the Department of Health and Social Care in England if in the days and weeks ahead he believes he will require even greater quantities of vaccine to fully meet the needs of Northern Ireland? Thank you. Um, and, I, and again, I thank the member. He makes, he makes a valid point when I said earlier, you know, for, and this is specific, Mr Speaker, for, for the over 65 target. Our age group, we had set that target of the 85 per cent, which was 275,000. Um, we approved the additional purchase of, of another 10,000 vaccines, uh, which I said had arrived on Thursday, the 5th of November. I can report to the member and to the House as well that having contacted Matt Hancock um, over the last 24 hours, um, we've actually uh, been able to obtain an additional 15,000 vaccines as well. So rather than a our 85 per cent target that we had set ourselves in the vaccines order to achieve that. Uh, we now have actually more vaccines on the way as well, which will be put into a further programme of vaccination. Nicole Paula Bradshaw. Thank you for coming to the Chamber today. Um, you talked about the exceptional uptake in the flu vaccine. What lessons are being learnt for the forthcoming rollout of the coronavirus vaccine programme, both in terms of operational issues but also communication? Thank you. Um, and, and I think the member, she, you know, I, I, her last point is bang on the money. I think it's the communication aspect of this, um, which, as I said, I had the conversation earlier this afternoon in regards to PHA and those representatives of the board as to how we get that communication correct, as to how the, the distribution of the vaccines work, and especially in regards to COVID vaccines, as we see the only, well, there's now two that's on the market, one that the UK has actually pre-ordered, and there, there is logistical uh, challenges in regard to how that's managed, because it has to be stored at minus 70 for a period of time, and then can be stored in normal fridges for the last five days of use. So there is a large logistical piece of work, but it's also in regards of communication as in identifying those cohorts who will be eligible in the early stages to make sure that the GPs, uh, community pharmacy um, and all other aspects have, have those members clearly identified and that we put in a process and a location that we can do it safely as well, as I said earlier, in regards to some of the fantastic work that we've seen brought forward by GPs uh, and community pharmacies in regards to how they've actually delivered mass vaccination programmes. Like, I, I don't think any, any of us in this House, uh, even this time last year, was, would have envisaged uh, flu vaccination programmes being completed in underground car parks as well, but they proved to be highly effective um, and highly deliverable and people were able to do it in, in most cases in the comfort of their own cars as well. So it's about making sure we get that communication phase right when the vaccine for COVID does become available. Well, Palm Cameron. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the um, Health Minister for his attendance here this afternoon. Um, I also welcome the news that the flu vaccine will be made available to those who are most vulnerable. Um, on the 12th of October, there were 46 care homes with COVID-19 outbreaks, yet on the 12th of November, that number had risen to 143, um, all the time when hospitality and close contact services were closed. It makes no sense that many months on into this pandemic, there is no rapid testing or mass testing of staff in key wards or in care homes to complement the vaccines. Um, this should be a daily, daily uh, occurrence for those key healthcare workers. Regardless of what other uh, regions are doing, um, and I have heard that some care settings in England are carrying out daily testing for both staff and visitors, can I respectfully ask the Minister why um, he is not testing healthcare staff on a daily basis? Um, I, and with respect uh, to the member, you know, I am aware that has been something that has been raised in a number of, of press releases. Um, from our party, although not connected directly to the flu vaccination programme. 
and uh, what I will say to the member as well when she indicates the number of care homes uh, that we have currently indicating as having outbreaks, that is due to your positive and reactive actually testing program that we have introduced, and something I know the member was was supportive of, something that the Commissioner for Older People was supportive of as well. She, she speaks of, of uh, a number of pilot programs that are currently undergoing in Liverpool, uh, and I think in, in, a sort of, in a number of care homes in the south southeast of England, which have been in the media today. Uh, one of the things I'll say to the member is we're fully plugged into the, those pilots because that's what they are. They're actually testing the viability of the testing machines, the protocols, and the utilisation to make sure that we use them uh, with, in, in the best way they can be used to support the residents, to support the patients, and to, to support staff. In regards to testing hospital workers, which I think was part of our, our, our line as well, because in line with you know, our current testing pro protocols, testing is prioritised um, actually for all our healthcare workers, and that includes hospital staff who are symptomatic or whose household contacts are symptomatic to help enable uh, those essential workers to return to work as soon as possible. So the position with regard to routine testing of all hospital staff is kept under active review. Uh, and with regard to the new testing technologies, which I was talk, uh, speaking about, there are emerging plans. Uh, that, you know, sorry, those technologies that are emerging, plans are progressing with a, a range of local partners and experts for actually testing those pilots across different settings, including healthcare settings, uh, that will include repeat testing of asymptomatic healthcare staff. Um, the new tests for asymptomatic people aim to identify those at risk of spreading the virus and reduce the risk of onward infection and to find positive cases earlier to reduce actually transmission of, of the virus. So those pilots are something that we're watching and watching with interest to make sure that the equipment is effective and efficient enough and actually will bring benefit to what we want to do. Call earlier, Flynn. Oh, good. Can call you. Um, I know it was touched on earlier from one of the members around um, guaranteeing that the over 65s would have um, access, that you have enough stock for the, the, the flu vaccine. But I'm just wondering if the Minister can guarantee that everyone over the age of 65 will be able to receive this vaccine um, before the end of November. Thank you. Um, and, and again, I, I thank the member for the point. As I, as, as I said earlier, our original our original estimations were for an 85 per cent uptake target, which equated to 275,000 vaccines. We actually purchased 286. We have received an additional 10,000, and as I said in the response to Mr Chambers, there is an extra 15,000, uh, which has been agreed by DHSC uh, for part of the Northern Ireland allocation. So we will have, we will have an excess of 300 and 311,000. Our current population of those over 65 set at 323. So there is enough there, not for, for everyone, but for the mass, vast majority, and far in excess of the percentage uptakes that we have seen uh, in previous years. I call Justin McNulty. I wish Cam Corley and I thank the Minister for coming to the Chamber today and for his answers thus far. Unfortunately, can I put on record my thanks to uh, healthcare staff and GP surgeries in schools and healthcare settings who have administered this uh, vaccine so diligently and, and proactively so far. Um, I spoke with one GP last week and she has she's told me about how incredibly and exceptionally hard uh, everybody is working. Um, have all residents in nursing homes been vaccinated, Minister? And can you tell me what the CMO has advised will be the impact on the battle against COVID of not having, um, the, not having the flu vaccine administered to people? Again, I thank the member um, for his questions. I think one of, the, one of the points the CMO has been making uh, in the last number of, of weeks and months is how vital it is that somebody doesn't contract flu on COVID at the same time. So our flu vaccination programme is actually well ahead of schedule where we would be in any normal year, but as everyone in this House knows and the member knows, this is not a normal year. So that's why, you know, and I welcome the member's acknowledgement uh, of the GPs, of our community nurses, um, for community pharmacy as well, who have been taking forward this vaccination programme. In regards to those over 65, everyone over 65 is, is eligible uh, for the vaccine, no matter where they are resident. Just before I call the next uh, member, could I ask members to uh, come to their questions very quickly because we have a number of members who still want to ask questions, so please uh, keep your introductions very, very brief and to the, the minimum. And I call 
Robbie Butler. Mr. Speaker, I very much welcome the clarity, uh, and it does stand in stark contrast to what has been reported until now, Minister. Will the Minister give uh, us a commitment that there will be close monitoring of the development of the additional vaccine, both by the PHA and the Health and Social Care Board? Um, I, I thank the, the, the member for his question. Uh, following the meeting earlier on today, I have asked for weekly uh, updates as to where we are in regards to the flu vaccination programme, not just in the distribution of the vaccine, but also at what percentage level. Uh, we are of uptake across all groups as well. While today we are specifically talking about the over 65, there are another, n- number of other uh, groups who are also eligible um, for, for the flu vaccine, all pregnant women, all individuals under 65 with a current chronic medical det- condition, uh, primary school ch- children, frontline health care workers who are employed by a trust, and frontline social care workers employed by a trust as well. Um, so there are a number of additional groups who are eligible for the flu vaccine, and I have asked the PHA and the board to make sure that I receive regular updates as to how the, the, the remaining part of our flu vaccination programme uh, is progressing. I call Jerry Carl. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, does the, thank, thanks, the Minister, for his answers. Does the Minister seriously believe that the potential COVID vaccine now being touted in the media as being available here in December uh, will be, or was that just a line inserted in the, an executive press release last week in order to see a face during a, the mother of all storm and shambles? Thank you. Um, and again, I thank the member. I am here to answer questions in regards to flu vaccine, but happy enough to talk about coronavirus vaccine. As well, I think what we have seen reported in the media is an advance um, statement by, by a, a company that they now have a vaccine that will be 90 per cent effective. It is one of the vaccines that the UK government has actually pre-bought, so we will be part of that uptake, as I reported to the House um, last week. Uh, our allocation will be enough vaccine to, if I recall off the top of my head, speaker, I think it is 275,000 individuals in Northern Ireland will be able to receive that vaccine. Um, there's reports today now of another vaccine uh, coming onto the market, which is claiming to be 95 per cent effective as well. It's not one of the ones that was in the UK uh, pre-procurement exercise, but I'm led to believe now that the UK government is in negotiations with that company uh, to make sure that if it does become available safely on the market, that we will have access and by default we will get our share uh, as being part of the United Kingdom. In regards to the availability, it is widely believed that there will be some of the vaccine uh, available by the end of this year, but it should not be perceived as a panacea for, for everything or for, or for COVID. And I think uh, any of, any of the, the, the experts here talking about the efficacy and the utilisation of vaccines are indicating that it will be well into next year before the vaccine is able to have its real effect as how it combats COVID in the community. I would ask uh, the next members to ask the question related to the urgent oral question on the paper today. Claire Sugden. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Um, Minister, are there any known contraindications of those having already received the seasonal flu vaccine and then receiving the specific COVID-19 uh, vaccine? And Will patients who have tested positive for COVID-19 um, make use of, the, of the, 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 the anticipated COVID vaccine? I suppose I ask these questions because that will help with the management of um, uh, unexpected programme in the, the winter months. <laughs> and I think um, one of the points that was a concern uh, was expressed by, by the GPs and one I share with them uh, is that we really need to get the flu vaccination programme out of the way before we can uh, commence the, the COVID one because there is, I think, advice and guidance out there that there should be at least um, three weeks between either vaccine uh, being delivered to make sure that both have their, their maximum effect. Um, so, so, in regards to any known studies of that, uh, I'm sure that is ongoing because, as we are well aware of the two COVID vaccines that are now uh, reported as being available, uh, none of them have went through their full clinical. Uh, on safety trials for, for utilisation uh, in the community. And until that process is actually completed, um, I, I do not think they will be used widely um, in the United Kingdom. So that piece of work still has to be done. Um, but I think the point, um, just to back up what the member is saying, is the, the importance that any COVID uh, vaccine is safe uh, to use, but we also promote it as widely as possible for those who are eligible to use it should be using it and uptaking it as well. So there is no 
there is no, uh, I suppose, barrier, uh, for want of a better word, if anybody has contracted COVID in the past or tested positive for COVID, that will leave them ineligible for the vaccine. Call Paul Fruit. Speaker, the Minister will know, as I have corresponded with him, uh, about the growing number of residents, vulnerable residents in North Antrim who have not been able to avail of the flu vaccine because they have had to drive in to practice instead of walk in. Can the Minister shed some light on that issue? Is it a growing problem and how does he fix it? I, I think the member, and it is something he has raised, he has raised with me in correspondence. And I think when we talked about you know, the protocols and the advances that we've seen in, in GP surgeries, you know, the drive-ins, the underground car parks, you know, were great advances. But one of the things that our GP colleagues, community pharmacy, and our practice nurses have always made aware or made available is that ability still to walk into clinics, should they be even you know, in community halls, church halls, so that they can a feel of the, of the flu vaccine. So, uh, what has actually been done at a GP level is those members who, who don't have or make themselves known that they will other uh, other abilities to obtain the vaccine will be made available to them. And I think I've given that to to the answer and to the member in writing as well. Call Pat Sheehan. Thank the I thank the minister for taking this uh, question today. I'm surprised to hear him saying that the story that was broken by a reputable, reputable journalist th this morning is not true, uh, because there has been some other evidence of difficulties with the rollout of this vaccine. The minister himself mentioned the pauses, and his own colleague in the health committee told us some weeks ago that there, were, there was a delay in the rollout of the school vaccination programme. So there are issues, and I suppose. Confidence in the PHA at the moment isn't at a premium, given their woeful underestimation of the number of positive COVID cases. So, can the minister explain why he is so confident? And I answered the question to my colleague uh, Orlea Flynn: Why he is so confident that everyone who needs a, a vaccine or wants a vaccine will get it in a timely fashion? Gormaugut. And I thank the member in regards to his comments regard to in PHA. I noted his exchange with PHA officials uh, in the health committee a number of weeks ago. I don't think they were edifying. I don't think that any member, elected member of this house, should speak to any official, no matter how much they disagree or want to challenge the evidence they're bringing or what they're saying. Uh, and I don't think it did the member any good in how he spoke to to the PHA officials who were in front of, of the committee. In regards to uh, the comments that I made in regards to the reporting, uh, which I actually said was the, the BBC report was, had incorrectly stated that Northern Ireland did not receive its full vaccine quota, while one million doses were ordered between 500 and 600,000 were delivered. That was inaccurate, and I stand over that comment, and it's in, it's in Hansard as well. So, in regards to the uptake, the work is ongoing between GP practices, the Health and Social Care Board, Community Pharmacy, uh, and the PHA in regards to make sure that we get the rollout of the second uh, batch of vaccine, which now has been delivered in Northern Ireland. The reason the, the, the programme was paused was because of the success of the delivery um, of those mass vaccination programmes which were actually delivered by GPs in the first instance. So we actually got in, in, in front of the delivery uh, of vaccines that, that we were expecting and the additional ones we had ordered over, over the summer. Uh, they are now uh, in Northern Ireland. They will now be distributed to GP practices as necessary to meet the demand that is there. And in regards to the uptake of one through the percentages, especially in the, in the over 65s, we had ordered enough for an 85 per cent uptake, uh, with a ten, actually with a 7 per cent uh, wastage rate at that point as well, but on top of that, we have now received additional vaccines coming in from the DHSC in the UK. Steve Egan, about one minute. All right, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Uh, Principal Speaker. And uh, may I thank the Minister for his comments so far. Uh, one of the issues, as speaking of somebody who's had the flu vaccine and somebody who's been a cancer survivor, one of the issues that was mentioned in my local GB surgery was the fact that quite a few people didn't turn up at their allotted times. Uh, could the minister help me in getting the message out there that if you are allotted a slot for a flu vaccination, you do make every effort you can, if you can do so, to be there to make sure that is there for that vital health uh, business? Thank you. Um, and I thank the member, and I think it has been well rehearsed the importance of getting the flu vaccine. 
and especially when our colleagues across, as I say again, GP practices, practice nurses, community pharmacy, go to the, the, the effort of organising the flu programmes and the flu vaccination programmes that we've seen across the com country, I would encourage everybody to utilise the slots that they are offered because they are being delivered in a timely and efficient manner to make sure that we get not just the, the, the efficient uptake of flu vaccines here in Northern Ireland, but by, make the best use of our professionals' time as well. And that concludes this item of business, members. And could members just take a read for a moment, please? <laughs>